Okay. So I want to talk and I'll, I'll keep my time short because I, uh, well, yeah, um, I, I want to respect, you know, the kind of time. Um, I'm interested right now in many, many things, but th this is elemental aesthetics for the Anthropocene, earth, air, fire, and water. So um, elemental in the sense of earth, air, fire, and water, and this is not to oppose contemporary uh, periodic tables and uh, chemistry and physics and all that. I love that stuff. Um, but it's just to think about some foundational issues that we're all faced with uh, in the Anthropocene. And aesthetics in every sense that all of you uh, are more familiar with than I am uh, from multiple cultural perspectives, uh, from multiple genealogies, uh, and, and et cetera. Um, so, um, hang on one sec. One of the things I'm interested in is, is this kind of transition to whatever we want to call it, the post-human, the non-human, the anthropocenic, et cetera. Um, and I don't want to go too much into this, but these are some of the people that for me have been important as I've as I've tried to change the way I think about things and the way I behave about things, um, I maintain that there is in nature an infinite power of thinking, Spinoza's letter to Oldenburg. Um, this is not just human thinking. This is, and it's not just animate, it's also the inanimate. These divisions begin to blur and to fall away. And all of us have experience with practices and um, textualities that are moving in these directions. So I'll, I'll just assume those are in the background. Uh, Elizabeth Povinelli, an uh, uh, anthropologist who works mainly, well, she's at Columbia, but she works in Australia. The non-human animal, the rock, the river, the beach, the wind, the soil, let them be heard, be represented and representable in the governance of the earth. They have language too, they are agents too, but that immediately would make us think about what is language, what is agency, what is hearing, what is speaking. And so we have to do this uh, extraordinarily extensive recalibration of all of those terms, which again, all of you are involved with. And then finally, Michelle Sayre, um, what language do the things of the world speak? that we might come to an understanding with them. Um, yeah. So I, I, that's kind of a starting place for me. Um, I'm trying to uh, revise what I understand about these terms uh, with uh, students and community partners and university partners and, and colleagues. Okay, uh, the Anthropocene, big term, uh, we're all dealing with that as well, Valerie, as all those multiple horrible disasters that are going on these days. Um, so I, I think this, this series that you've devised comes at a particularly poignant moment. I guess every moment is poignant, but there's just so much going on that whatever we can do to bring a little peacefulness would be good. Anyway, I think it's not just a category of objectivity, this Anthropocene. It's, it's calling us, and, it, and we have to find a way to address the condition in which we find ourselves. Um, so all of us feel called by aesthetics, because here we are uh, once again struggling with what that means and what that implies. Um, so, I, you know, if we had more time, I'd be interested in really exploring with each of us how we how we respond to the various calls in, in our own lives that, that we that we somehow quote unquote hear. So I'm interested in wonder and all of its manifestations. Um, Plato and the Theotetus says philosophy comes from wonder, but that's just a very momentary definition. I'm interested in the derangement of the senses. Not, well, both from Rambeau's notion of the derangement of the senses, but I think we are re-educating our senses. We're relearning how to perceive, and that, of course, 
takes more than any individual or collective of individuals. It's a long-term process. Um, and I like the, the double play of the word sense in, term, in, in terms of sense and sensibility and meaning and that kind of thing. So there's just a list. Uh, we could all make lists very quickly. Um, okay, so this, you know, when I'm when I'm teaching around in these areas, and I've done a lot with the sustainable development goals, uh, the relationships between art and philosophy, the more than human city, I'll talk about that in, in just a few minutes. But I like to get all of us to to sort of pay attention a little more intensely. So for me, in other contexts, these are student generated uh, commentary. And then I'm, of course, there inflecting and, and facilitating. Um, but zones of care, I think unless we care about something, we never get engaged with it. And so I'm interested in how we develop zones of care and how we identify those and how they are or are not related to university practices in general. I think once we have a sense of what we care about, then we we find ways and methods of attending to this, what I will call right now a critical zone. Um, through whatever, through the senses, through thinking about it, through relationships, through expertise building, through uh, confusion, whatever. So, uh, yeah, right now I'm teaching a class on surrealism and we're talking a lot about the everyday marvelous, um, which I think Joshua's talk also really was, was hitting upon this kind of the way that every day becomes marvelous and worthy of attention. Uh, the next phase is kind of that typical phase of expertise that universities are generally quite good at. They're not good at a whole lot of different things, but this is something they, they know how to do is to generate expertise. It's an entirely different question when it's about sharing expertise and moving expertise out of um, the usual boundaries and, and partnering with uh, different community uh, activists and that kind of thing. So once we, um, like right now, I'm just as a, a quick example, I'm doing a tiny bit of work on, on stones and mountains, and I don't know anything about that stuff. So I'm having to build up my expertise, and then that leads me to a different sense of connectivity, both to stones and mountains, but also to geologists and uh, marine biologists and uh, geographers and artists and, and so forth and so on. And so I will ask my students to build out maps of connections they can make because I'm very, very concerned about their futures. And the sooner we can help them begin to articulate, here's some ways that what I'm interested in connects to the larger world, the better. Um, then I think I mean, all of these, this is a list, of course, but it's always a kind of arabesque. Um, it doesn't come linearly, although I often will develop it fairly linearly at first. Anyway, how do we change things? Um, the world is in a total mess, and we're all really deeply struggling with, you know, how do we change not just this individual moment, although I'm profoundly interested in that, but systems and ways of relating to each other politically and economically and um, personally and, and, and so religiously, so forth and so on. So I, I sort of wanna build in this change moment around the Anthropocene with students because they get depressed quite easily as do I about the, the massive uh, implications of this. And then of course, we're always all looping back all the time to see what happens next, to see what next steps are, to see where we began and, and what comes second and, and all of those questions. Okay, anyway, just a... Uh, this, this is a very Western division. It, for me, comes out of ancient Greek philosophy. Uh, I'm working with some Chinese students at Shanghai Jiao Tong um, and trying to generate 
a kind of Chinese Asian genealogy, and it's obviously China and Asia are two quite different things. But uh, I just want to say, it, you know, this is pretty classical Greek. Um, but I'm interested in in how, in a very very modest way, we can conjoin the imagination and materiality, uh, and in a very very modest way, how this contributes to a, a, a reorientation that I was mentioning earlier um, toward the planet, but not the planet writ large but my my cedar trees out there useless bay down the road and the planet writ large but we have to be careful to sort of mediate those uh in uh, uh, an imaginative way um so anyway this is a this is a very very famous city um uh, sorry that's funny it, it is a famous city <laughs> but it's also a famous sentence uh from aldo leopold's Lovely, lovely essay, Thinking Like a Mountain, a very short part of a Sand County Almanac, 1949. Um, all of you know this phrase, but, uh, you know, what does it feel like to you? Um, and just as you're thinking along here, think about if we say earth, air, water, fire, what are your associations with each of those specifically? How does that hook into your own personal history? How does that hook, in, uh, hook into your artistic and, and uh, conceptual practices? Um, how does it hook into your imaginative productions and so forth? Um, again, really rich stuff here that we could each produce. So Leopold says, we reach the old wolf in time to watch this famous, famous phrase, a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. So he, they'd shot a wolf. They're up in the mountains of the American Southwest. And he has this encounter. And it's a revelatory encounter. And it's a life-changing encounter. But this fierce green fire, we're talking about the earth, but somehow fire appears. And as we all know, these elements are not separate categories. They're interpenetrating, and then we can articulate them in different ways. Um, we can analyze them in different ways. But the fire is already here, and it's it's green. Um, I realized then, I have known ever since, that there was something new to me in those eyes. So there's this kind of revelation, this illumination of something different, something known only to her, the wolf and the mountain. So there's this triangulation going on between the wolf, the mountain, and the narrator, the man. Uh, but they all are kind of coming together in this moment of knowledge. But it's not a knowledge of what we could call matter of fact. Uh, it's something else. I was young then and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. So this kind of hugely erroneous conception of let's get rid of one thing so we can have better of something else. There's kind of a logic at work here that we're all familiar with. But after seeing the green fire die, which is brought back to life in writing, here we are again, hundreds of thousands of people have looked at this, I sense that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. Okay, so again, Knowledge is getting distributed differently here than we're used to. Uh, we usually use this language, I, I am a subject of knowledge, and there's the objects out there. And all of us here are trying to shift that around. Um, so there's the knowledge of the wolf, the knowledge of the man and the writer, and the knowledge of the mountain. Um, and we have to keep thinking about what can we possibly mean by that that's meaningful at all. Okay, so that's Earth. Air, uh, Wallace Stevens, the idea of order at Key West. This is only one stanza of Stevens' fantastic poem. Uh, I would encourage you to think about which poems and texts for you come to mind as we do Earth, Air, Fire, and Water. And I would encourage you to think about for you, what's the relationship between atmosphere, air, and mood? Um, yeah, uh, this idea of of mood uh, that always accompanies 
everything we do is extremely uh, intriguing. Um, anyway, you know, what type of weather does what to your moods? Okay, just very briefly, here's one stanza. So Key West, tip of Florida, Wallace Stevens went there often. Um, if it was only the dark voice of the sea that rose or even colored by many waves, if it was only the outer voice of sky and cloud of the sunken coral water walled, however clear it would have been deep air, the heaving speech of air, a summer sound repeated and a summer without end and sound alone. But it was more than that, more even than her voice and ours among the meaningless plungings of water and the wind. Theatrical distances, bronze shadows heaped on high horizons, mountainous atmospheres of sky and sea. So the whole poem is about what is this very odd relationship between the human human language and the human voice as a kind of poetics and poeticizing of the world and the sky and the sea uh, that we encounter in Key West. Um, Suck and Coral, Water Wall, there's Shakespeare and the Tempest. Um, the heaving speech of air, so air has its own speech. A summer sound repeated. It'd be interesting to talk about repetition and language and, and, and uh, novelty. But it was more than that. It's something more in us here, more than her voice. That is the singer in the poem. And ours, that is the poet writing the poem, among the meaningless plunging of water and wind. Meaningless, but nonetheless being brought to language. Theatrical distances, there's a whole theater of language, of poetry, of the atmospheres, of the kind of relations, the theatricality of our relations uh, with uh, the atmosphere. Um, and then mountainous atmospheres of sky and sea. So again, here we are in air, which is diaphanous. Uh, some of you may have read Peter Sloterdijk's massive sphere trilogy, lots on atmosphere there, but a lot of aesthetics philosophy goes back to this idea of mood and, and so forth, but mountainous atmosphere. So again, we get this just glancing mm, interpenetration uh, of the elements. Okay, uh, feel free, by the way, to interrupt uh, either in the chat or, or uh, his voice. And I'll leave some time at the end. We can talk about whatever you, you do or don't want to uh, talk about. Okay, fire. This is from Bachelard's uh, The Empedocles Complex. I wish we had time to read Empedocles, a really key source for these, these elementality. Um, but anyway, Bachelard, you know, fantastic uh, philosopher of science, but also uh, great on, on poetry and the imagination, the psychoanalysis of fire. The contemplation of fire brings us back. So that's we're, now we're in that repetition again to the very origins of philosophic thought, at least in Greece. Uh, and Greece is not Athens. Fire is an example of a sudden change. OK, so we get change or development and an example of circumstantial development. Fire goes where fire wants to. Less monotonous and less abstract than flowing water. So he's putting aside, I mean, this, this lava is flowing, uh, but he's, he's sort of contrasting the flowingness of water and, and fire, even more quick to grow and to change, to speed up with the passage of time. We could think a lot about time and, and the elements and time and our experience, and also modes of acceleration and going slow and, and what goes fast and what goes slow to bring all of life to its conclusion. It is fascinating and dramatic. So the, the dramatic, again, 
we've got a lot of thinking to do about the theatricalization or the drama, the dramatic of how the world appears and how we position ourselves towards it. Back to Joshua's talk on dance and Gemma's question on ritual. Um, and Monica, your, your sense of that collective joy. It magnifies human destiny. It links the small to the great. So that's interesting to me. I'm always curious about scale and, and what are points of linkage uh, between different scales. Mm, yeah, in classes, you can only go so far, but I think there's a lot of movement there. The hearth to the volcano. So some of you, uh, some of you have like, uh, well, certainly heaters, but uh, fireplaces or wood stoves. That idea of the coziness of the family hearth, but that's directly linked to the volcanic uh, action of the earth. Um, okay, uh, yeah, I'd like to say more about psychoanalysis, but we'll do that some other time. Okay, water. Uh, so think, uh, some of us are very close to water, some of us are not. We all are some percentage of water. Uh, we all uh, are dependent, of course, on water. So think about which body of water is really, what body of water do you love? And it could certainly be more than one, but what about that body of water is beloved to you? It may have something to do with your history, experiences, certainly with experiences, um, but what is the kind of uh, phenomenology of the type of water that you love? This is this is from a very recent book. Uh, Ibrahim Neme is from Beirut and is now working in different places on something called the Underground University. Um, from To Live to Tell Another Tale, which is particularly pertinent these days. Thus waves come in pairs, thinking with the Mediterranean. So the Mediterranean is pluralized, obviously, like everything else. A proverb in my other tongue roughly translate to do good and throw your deeds into the sea. There are many ways to interpret this saying, but most interpretations revolve around the inherent vastness of the sea. Point taken, the sea is vast, but what does it mean when we, um, every point of the sea is, is polluted now? And more and more, in terms of our knowledge, we are you know, penetrating to great depths, both for, well, all sorts of knowledge, but including mining. So what about this word vastness and its relationship to aesthetics and Kant's notion of the sublime and all that, which could be seen as a reflection of the vastness within us? Well, what is that these days? What is this? And do we actually still experience or think about that a kind of interior vastness of our inherent good nature? It speaks of that which belongs to a realm that is far greater than words, that which cannot be contained in speech, that which must be related to the transmuting and forgiving waters of the sea, to entrust the sea with our deeds is to allow the mysterious to become an ally. Valerie, are, are, are doing okay with time? Yeah, well, okay. take your time, Greg, please. Okay. Hang on, let me turn off my timer. Okay, so um, in addition to places that you associate with all of these elements, you know, what are the text and the paintings and the dances and the movies that, that come to your mind about all this? Um, I do think we're in kind of a, a, a massive paradigm shift. And so all of those elements of elementality will become important. Okay, this this is only to say about my teaching and 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 all of our learning and and gathering together that for me, I'm obviously devoted to reading and writing, uh, but I'm also devoted to projects of any scale at all. And this is my preferred way of working with students. Um, so these are projects that I am working on or have worked on simply to give a, a sense of uh, 
a little sense of possibility, but all of you are working on your own projects, that would be another zone of care and zone of attention for us to explore together. Um, and which projects different places and different times and different cultural contexts need. But so as I mentioned, I'm working on another form of becoming elemental with my colleagues in humanities and social sciences at Shanghai Jiao Tong. There was deep and surprising student interest in this. Um, and it, it's quite wonderful. Uh, I've done six years of an exchange between Hong Kong U and Utrecht University in the Netherlands on the More Than Human City, where we work with students to try to shift their imaginations away from simply the human city. It's not easy for any of us. Uh, and we keep asking that situationist question of where is the beach beneath the street? And how do we begin to discover that? I mentioned critical zones. This comes for me and from Bruno Latour, and he gets it from geology and hydrology and those kind of earth sciences. Uh, a big group working on fast geologies and dynamic coastlines. I know nothing again, but I like to be in situations where I don't know anything because then I get to learn a lot. Um, and these are geographers uh, of all sorts and marine biologists um, and artists and philosophers and stuff. And uh, finally, the liberal arts in the global south. Uh, this is a consortium that's run by uh, a colleague uh, in Nigeria and a woman uh, in something called GALA, which is the Global Academy of Liberal Arts at Bath Spa University. And then uh, with Wild Studios, we're working in Asia and Europe and the US and Australia on future readiness for students. I'm, as I said, I'm very, very worried about jobs and careers and meaning and all that stuff for, for our students. And so I'm trying to figure out ways of co-facilitating with partners in those regions to help be supportive basically in a very simple sense. Okay, so anyway, just to kind of, uh, again, this is not important. What's important is what you're working on and such as this fantastic uh, series on aesthetics, Valerie, that, that you've so brilliantly organized. Okay, so the whole thing for me about elementality is this reorientation. Um, and so I'm, a, I'm, I'm actually obsessed with prefixes. So I like to know what this RE is doing. I'm very interested in the prefix enter and trans. Um, and then orientation. Uh, yeah, so how do you orient yourself day in, in your daily life? How do we orient ourselves to the profound difficulties of geopolitics and the Anthropocene these days? Uh, anyway, it's an interesting word to me. Anesthesis, you know, it, it's not just, we all know this, but a lot of our colleagues don't. It's not just art. It's not just beauty, certainly, um, but it's it's actually the kind of derangement in a in a creative way of the senses and and perception, uh, which is one of its early Greek meanings. Um, and then, yeah, post post Kant, it becomes something else. Okay, so futurities in the plural. All of us are are sitting here, and all of all of us are doing the work we're doing to give a, a more flourishing inflection to futurity. Um, so it's always plural, thank goodness. Uh, for me, and I'll just speak for myself, of course, what else can we do right now? But it, it's it's imminent. That is, uh, I'm interested really in, well, uh, the experience of, of what's going on, what's happening. Um, and we can talk more about some of the philosophical sources that if anybody wants to. I, Ionians. Uh, so as, as you know, the Ionians were the so-called pre-Socratics, a term which I hate, um, but so what? Um, and it, it's a series of islands and archipelagos, uh, which is why I put the next word down, archipelagics. There's a whole, as, as again, as all of you are participating in, a whole new attempt to rethink uh, 
I guess, the politics and imaginary of continentality and colonization and logics and that kind of thing. So the reason I made this list is these are some of the early qualifications that I am intrigued by as possible ways of doing this reorientation. And please don't take any of this literally. And please, please, please don't assume that it's going back to the good old days. There's no such thing as we all know. It's all movements ahead and really creating new structures and new insights for each other. Indigeneities, um, where I am, you know, in the state of Washington and Whidbey Island, Whidbey Island, he was a, a, a British captain long time ago uh, when they came to settle this area. So there are many, many, many different Native American groups here. And uh, I think there's an enormous amount to learn there. Uh, some of you have read Edward Cohn's book, How Far to Speak, and that's just one example of many, or Anat Singh or whatever, on the beginnings of developing new networks of listening. Pluralities, um, yeah, I think we have to really work to keep pluralities moving along wherever we are. I, I like the, the image of an arabesque. Uh, a recent book was Urban Arabesque, but I like arabesque anyway because there's no beginning, no end, and it's just a proliferation of movement and form um, and, and energy and also with its connections to dance. And finally, uh, Deleuze, et cetera, et cetera, is term continuing variations. So we're, all of us, I think, are trying to create provisional moments of insight that can then have a, another form down the road, uh, but we certainly are not able or interested in, in kind of settling things into place uh, as if they're here to stay, nothing is. So a huge thank you, Valerie, again to you for just your, your vision for this and all your enormous work on publishing and writing. Uh, this, is a, this is down the, the road from where I'm sitting now, that's Useless Bay and those are the Olympic Peninsula Mountains in the distance. And this is what I call architecture. People come by for some reason or another, they're always building structures on the beach, uh, which become quite, quite interesting. So let me, let me stop sharing my screen. Great. Hello, Arnold. Oh. Um, so anyway, thank you so much. Um, 